Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Well, take your Bible, if you will, and look with me to the Gospel of Matthew, the uh, sixth chapter, if you will, Matthew chapter number six. And I'm going to confess to you, I have four messages, and uh, I don't know how we will get to it, but you just hang on, and we'll see where we, where we land. You know that uh, America today is 21, excuse me, 28 million, excuse me, I'm going to get this right. If I keep doing what I'm doing, I'll never get through any of the first sermon, much less the four of them. America is $28 trillion in debt. Now, do you know what a trillion is? I mean, if you, if you got any idea how much a trillion dollars is, let me give you a little bit of perspective. If you added a million dollars a day since the birth of Jesus, it still wouldn't be a trillion dollars. Still takes 700 more years to get to a trillion dollars. And to top that off, we're, we're getting ready to add in the next few weeks two more trillion to that debt. Just in the next few weeks. And it's no wonder that uh, American people today are filled with anxiety and fear and worry and the, because the fact of the matter is, how are we going to pay for all of that? Higher taxes. Higher taxes uh, mean more stress and uh, more worry placed on people. Now, uh, I have a little saying with my staff, don't bring me a problem if you don't have a solution. And uh, I've got that solution with me today. And I want to talk to you as we continue our series uh, on the Lord's Prayer on give us this day our daily bread. I just want to stop there. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, when you're talking about bread, uh, there's some pretty strong uh, significance uh, about that. Jesus is talking a whole lot more uh, than sunbeam bread. Do y'all remember sunbeam bread? Well, I used to love to go to Greenville, South Carolina, and uh, they had a sunbeam bread store down there. And uh, you could take that fresh bread, and really, and what we'd do is we'd, we'd take the edges off of it, and then I'd roll it up in a big old ball. And it just stick together. I mean, you could just about squeeze the juice out of it. You know, I'd pop that and just, oh, there's just, go down to Duke's Sandwich. If you've never had Duke's Sandwiches, you've never lived. And back then, uh, when, when the founder was still running, they would slice the edges off of it too and fix it. And, and they'd use that fresh bread. So now Jesus is not just talking about uh, that uh, nourishment there. Uh, let, me, let me give you three or four things that he's talking about. First of all, when you see bread in the scripture, Jesus is talking about really the basics of life uh, itself. Now, we need air, we need uh, to eat, we need nourishment, and of course, we need water. Uh, and, and the wonderful thing about God is, and, and I'm, you know, I don't worry about a whole lot of stuff uh, when it comes to creation, because uh, when God created everything, uh, he also provided for the needs of his creation. Uh, this, this, the passage would be Psalm 104 uh, if you want to write that down in the margin of your Bible. Now, here is God's economy. Let, let me just read this uh, a little bit to you. He says, uh, how, how many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with uh, creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. There are the ships that go to and fro, and the Leviathan which you formed a frolic there. These all look to you to give them their food at the proper times. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. Now, here, here it is. Here's God's economy. God says, I supply it, you gather it. What that means is, is that you pray about your needs, but then you don't just sit down on the couch and veg out 
waiting on something or somebody to bring it to you. You go out and you get a job and you work for it, just like the nation of Israel did. Uh, God rained manna down um, for them every day, uh, but they had to go up and gather it up. See, they had to go out there and pick it up. Work still builds character. Let me give you the second thing. Uh, that bread is uh, represented in the Bible uh, or as, as the Bible. L listen to the scripture. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, Jesus is uh, quoting Deuteronomy here, and it's that same scenario uh, when uh, uh, they got hungry and uh, God began to just give them that manna, manna in the morning and manna at noon and manna at evening time. Uh, they had uh, manna omelets for breakfast. They had manna stew uh, for lunch. And they had manna cotti uh, for dinner. Uh, they just had it all going on. And, and so he provided uh, for them. And God is saying to us, not only do you need this for physical nourishment, you need spiritual nourishment as well. And then um, boy, one of the things that we are learning more and more and more during this this isolated processes that we have been going through for the last 10 months or so is that bread also represents brotherhood. It represents community. It represents the, the body of Christ that, that is getting together. So uh, here's what the word says. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ. In the Old Testament, they would bring an offering basket full of bread. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, the Bible says that they devoted themselves to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread together. I don't know about you, uh, but man, the last eight or 10 months or so ha has been a phenomenal strain on the body of Christ because we have not had that community that we, uh, I miss the handshakes and I miss the hugs and I miss all of that fellowship and these reserve signs just absolutely drive me nuts. All right, let me, let me get off of that. Uh, it, it also, bread also represents, as I read a moment ago, the broken body of Jesus. When Jesus gave the Lord's Supper, you know, he, he broke the bread and he says, this bread, it represents my body. Uh, which is broken for you. So the point is, whether it's a physical need, whether it's a spiritual need, whether it's a relational need or an emotional need, God says, I'm going to give you everything that you are ever going to need. All I want you to do is to depend on me. Now, how in the world do we depend on him? How do I let God meet the needs of my life. I, I was just thinking about these singers uh, that were up here while they were singing a moment ago, leading us in worship. I, I was thinking about what a toll, Rodney, these last months have taken uh, on your group and, and uh, where, where you have ministered all over the world and were not able to gather together and to have the concerts. Well, it just came to a point that they literally had to depend on God to meet every need of uh, their life. But how do you do that? The Bible says whatsoever is not of faith is sin. The Bible says according to your faith let it be done unto you. The Bible says without faith it is impossible uh, to please God. So how then do you depend? Here's what depending on God means. Give us this day our daily bread. Let's break it down and uh, let, let's, let's just see what God is going to say to us. The, the first thing I want to share with you is that you have to have the right perspective. Write that down. I got, if I'm going to depend on God, I've got to have the right perspective. In other words, I've got to come to realize that God is the source of all of my needs. The Bible tells us that every good and perfect gift where? It comes from God. Now, now think with me for just a minute. Think about all of the good things that you have in your life. And, and realize today that you wouldn't have that if God hadn't given it to you. He is the source of all good. Now, the other thing, and this is almost uh, 
uh, almost the same word, but a little bit different. Not only is he the source, he is the supplier of all good things. Um, you, you don't know, uh, I don't know what your needs are. You don't know what my needs are. Uh, but I do know this, that uh, whatever my need is, God is my supplier. The Bible says that God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory through uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you understand there's nothing that I have that God didn't give to me as a, a believer. And so in these troublesome times that we're facing, I ought never to panic, I ought never to be anxious, I ought never to be worried that I am not going to have enough. Why is that? God's my source and he's my supplier. Um, now, Hold on to that because the next good thing I want to tell you is that God wants to meet your needs. He has a desire to meet your needs. Matthew 7, 11 says, if you were asked by your son for bread, would you give him a stone? How much more likely is it that your heavenly father will give good things to them uh, that love him? Now, if my daughter comes to me and she says, Daddy, um, I'm hungry. I, I want something to eat. Uh, do you think for a minute uh, that I'm going to give her a brick? I, I am broken. I am flawed. I am imperfect. But I love my kids. And I'm going to do whatever I have to do to meet that need in Andrea's life. And God says, if you broken, sinful, imperfect people know how to care for your kids, don't you think that I know how to take care of you? Uh, now, now, where is God? What, where's God in all of this? I, I want you to see his position. I want you to see his stance with me. He is waiting patiently for you to get to the point that you simply ask him to meet those needs uh, that in your life. By, by the way, I'll, I'll just say this. Uh, if you have unmet needs in your life, it's not God's fault. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. 20 times in the New Testament alone, God challenges us to ask. Think with me about the ask and seek and not for a minute. Take the first three letters of those words, ask, seek, and not. What, 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 what does it say? It says ask. Ask. Call on God. You understand that God is saying to you and to me, my design is that when you have needs in your life that you come to me and that you ask me and I will supply and meet those needs. That's God's design for you. Let me, let me just ask you uh, as we wade our way through here this morning, who is the source of your needs? I'll tell you right now, Washington is not the source of my need. I don't care who's in, office, in the office. Doesn't matter to me. Well, it matters to me, but uh, it, not as my source. Wall Street is not my source. How about your job? Is, you, do you consider your job as being uh, your source? By the way, just for information's sake, 22 million people lost their job at the beginning of the pandemic. 22 million. 12 of them have been restored. That means that 10 million people still right now uh, are without uh, a job. Who are you looking for uh, to meet your needs? Some of you got married thinking your spouse would meet your needs. You found out just about a few hours after you said I do that their needs were bigger than yours. Can I get a witness from anybody in, in the house? You, you understand only God can meet your need. Your job may play out. But thank God we have him in heaven. When one faucet gets turned off, he's got another faucet that he's going to turn on for us. Now, let me give you the second thing. Not only do you have to have the right perspective, you have to have the right pursuit. The right pursuit. That means that you're going to chase God every day of your life. Give us what? This day. 
He didn't say, give us tomorrow. He didn't say, give us next week. He didn't say, give us next month. He said, give us this day, what? Our daily, not weekly, not monthly, not annually. Give us this day, our daily bread. God says, I want you to trust me one day at a time. You understand life is made out, made up of, of little increments. Years are made of months and months are made of weeks and weeks are made of days and days are made of hours and da, 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 da. And God is just saying, every day of your life, I want you to place your faith and your trust uh, in me. Now, let, let me give you Philippians chapter 4 and help you understand how you can depend on him on a daily basis. They're all contained right here in two verses in Philippians 4 verse 6. Let, let, listen to how he says now. You ready to go for this? Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. Now, I want to, I want to spend just a minute. There are four things that uh, rise up out of these two verses that will help you get to the point that you depend on God every day of your life. The first one is this, and they all begin with an E. Eliminate worry. Eliminate worry. He says, don't be anxious about anything. How much is anything? It's everything. May I say to you that this is probably, Landon, the most difficult commandment in all the Bible. When the Bible tells me not to kill anybody, you know, that's not too hard. The, the Bible says don't commit adultery. Well, that's a no-brainer. But boy, this commandment here, don't worry, don't be anxious. Would you agree with me that that's probably harder than any of the other commandments? Um, and by the way, let me help you understand. It's not just a bad habit. It's a sin, according to the Word of God. And when you get to worrying so much, as a believer, what you're really saying is, God, I don't believe your promises. Uh, God, I, I don't believe that you love me. When you worry about stuff, you're actually saying, God, I don't believe that you are capable of meeting my needs. And frankly, that's an insult to God. I can't imagine my kids coming up to me when they were growing up and saying to me, Daddy, um, you know, I know you're a good guy, uh, but I don't think that you are capable of keeping a roof over our head. Uh, Dad, I don't believe that you're capable of putting food uh, on our table. And, and Daddy, by the way, I, I, I don't think that you're able uh, to provide for us and to keep us safe and secure. Do you know how that would make me feel as an earthly daddy? But when we worry about stuff, we're really saying the same thing to God. Um, I'm going to stretch you a little bit. But worry is practical atheism. You simply don't believe that God uh, can take care of you. So God says, don't worry about anything. And then every time that God gives you a negative, he always comes right back and he gives you a positive. He says, now, I, I don't want you to worry about anything. I want you to depend on me. I want you to trust in me. Don't do this. Don't do that. Now, he comes on the heels of that and says, here's what I want you to really get wrapped up in. And it begins with it. Entreat me, he says. Entreat uh, the Lord. Pray about everything. So you have two choices here contained in the scriptures. You can worry about stuff, which means that you're talking to yourself about those things, or you can pray about stuff and it means that you are talking to God about it. You have a choice. Who are you going to talk to about the needs uh, of your life? Um, one, one of the things I've found out in, in my uh, uh, 49 years is that um, worry has never solved a problem. Um, 
Prayer has solved thousands of problems for me, but worry has never, ever solved anything. What's this in Romans 8, 32? He says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? I'm just going to say this and then we're going to go on. If God cared enough about you and loved, loved you enough to die for you, don't you think he cares enough about you to meet the smaller needs of your life and the lesser needs? Now, let, let me give you the third in, that I see in these two verses. Express gratitude. Entreat the Lord. Eliminate worry. Express gratitude. He says, with thanksgiving. And the Bible tells us that in the midst of all things that we are to give thanks. Now, I'll be very honest with you. Uh, there's a lot of bad stuff happened to me that I didn't thank God for. But, but here, here's my take on that, on that phrase. In everything, give thanks. Um, I don't have to like what happens to me, but in the midst of something bad, by the way, um, just in the last few days, two deer have hit my car, transmission is tore up, and my furnace went out last night before I went to bed. So I, I, I'm in it, I'm in it. I'm in it. Thank you, God, for tearing up my furnace. No, I ain't doing it. Got two cars in the shop. But here's my take on it. God, I thank you that in the midst of this, I know that you're going to meet every need that I have. Uh, you're going to meet every need. In the midst of it, uh, thank you for it. Okay. And, and then he says, here, here's this long list of stuff. And he says, think on these things. So envision, here's the other E, envision holy things. Don't worry. Be thankful. And focus your thoughts on the things of God. So uh, if I were to go back and, and recapture that, he's just simply saying to you and to me, don't worry about this stuff. Pray about it. Be thankful in the midst of whatever circumstance that you're in that God is going to meet that need. And then keep your focus of attention on the things of God. L listen to Isaiah 26. He will keep in perfect peace all those who trust in him, whose thoughts turn often to the Lord. So look at me a minute. Look this way. How much time do you give to thinking about God or the things of God? How much time do you devote in your life? Or is uh, your thoughts about God simply relegated to Sundays. Is that about the only time you think about God? So he says, I want you to think on these things. And, and let me give you this next one now. It's uh, uh, the right pursuit, the right perspective, and the right portion. Now, some of you are going to turn me off here, and uh, I understand that, and I understand where that comes from. Okay, you ready for this? Give us our daily bread. Didn't say give me my daily bread. Give us our daily bread. What God gives to you, he intends for you to share that with others. Why? So you can be like him. Period. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, here's the deal. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. Amen. Valentine's Day is coming up. Did you know that Valentine's Day is a Christian holiday? It really is. Uh, there was a monk by the name of Valentine who uh, back, uh, oh, I think it was the first century, second century, somewhere along in there, uh, when Rome uh, was in charge and Rome declared to the Christian soldiers, you can no longer fall in love and you can no longer marry. Uh, so this monk by the name of Valentine, he would secretly marry uh, those soldiers. He was martyred and then uh, they declared him to be a saint, St. Valentine's Day. It is a Christian uh, holiday. 
Understand that love is a gift from God. God is love. And, and let, let me, the only way that I can love somebody else, really, is because God loves me. I wouldn't know how to love anybody else if God didn't love me. Um, you wouldn't get a card on Valentine's Day that said, I need you, I want you, I have to have you. That, that's not love, that's lust. Big difference. It's full of selfishness. You, you understand, love uh, is about giving. It's about others uh, along the way. Now, one of the ways that we share is through our finances. Uh, are you a stingy person or are you a giving person? Are you a sharing person? Are you generous or are you uh, miserly? And one of the things that uh, I will declare here, the more successful that you are in this life, uh, the more difficult you're going to find it to be. Uh, to be generous and, 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 a, and a giving, sharing person. Why is that? Because you'll start depending on your bank account uh, rather than on the heavenly bank. Uh, you'll start depending on what you have mustered up and you'll quit praying. You'll just write the check. You won't pray about it before you write it. You'll just write the check and go ahead and pay whatever it is that you want to have rather than go before God. Now, I'm not a, I'm not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet. But I believe with all of my heart that you're going to need what I'm about to give you in the next five minutes. Before you get out of this life, I believe you're going to need this. First of all, I challenge you to learn to be a conduit. What God gives to me, he wants to give through me. What God gives to me, he wants to give through me. So you're either going to be a cup and uh, you're just going to say, okay, God, here's my cup. Fill that thing up here now. And it gets up to the brim, and it's just there. There's no escape route. Uh, there's no channel out of the cup. Or you can be a straw and, and, and let God fill that straw so that it can flow through you and bless others, not only bless you, uh, but as you bless others, you're going to be blessed. Listen to the scripture in 2 Corinthians 9. Bill Stafford taught uh, this in our church a number of years ago. He said, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread uh, for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. By the way, you don't have to be wealthy to be generous. You just have to be generous. Amen. Maybe we ought to just come to the place that we ought to be able to say, God, I don't have much, but I'm willing to share whatever I have with somebody else. Yes. All right, then the conditional promise is this. Got to be the conduit, but here's the condition. In Isaiah chapter 58... Write this down somewhere in the margin of your Bible. Isaiah 58 and verse 7. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? That Well, there's a tough one. He's just saying, uh, hey, by the way, uh, if you see some relatives that need help, help them. Okay, you'll get that tomorrow. Um, then your light, okay, he says, share it. Then, here's the condition. Uh, be generous, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, even in your own family. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer you when you cry for help. And he will say, here I am. Did, did you hear what the conditions were? Take care of the needy, the less fortunate. Feed, I'm, I'm looking out over the congregation now. And one of the strongest ministries 
uh, that we have going on out of this fellowship is food for families. Thank God this week they called uh, my office and said, Pastor, we, we've got so much food. We've got to find some way and find more hungry people. I picked up the phone in a matter of, of two or three minutes. Uh, we had all kinds of people ready to receive uh, that food. We, we've got a, a, a peanut butter and oatmeal drive that's coming up two weeks in the month of February. And, and I want to ask all of you to participate in that and let's feed the hungry uh, of our area. And God says, take care of the hungry. Feed those uh, that uh, need to be fed and clothe those uh, that need to be clothed then I'll watch you back your righteousness will go before you now in other words what Jesus said is if I meet the needs of others he'll meet mine all right here we go and, and I'll give this as be the last one it's cultivation do, do you remember the story of the feeding of the 5,000 huh uh, the Bible says that 5,000 men, not counting women and children. So there could have been as many as 15,000 people out there that followed Jesus. You got me? Shake your head like that. I'm still tracking with you. Jesus said, uh, feed these people. What? Feed these people? Where are we going to? We're so far from McDonald's. There's no way. and We don't have enough money even if they were right here. How are we going to feed these people? And somebody mustered up a little old boy who had five barley loaves and a couple of fish. And they gave it to Jesus. He blessed it. He broke it. And the Bible says everybody got filled up to the brim. Filled up. Here's my point. God multiplies whatever you give him. You don't have time to do personal devotions, you say. I promise you this, if you'll mark out the time and set aside the time, he'll multiply your time. You don't have the energy, give God your energy. He'll multiply it. You'll wind up with more energy than you ever dreamed about. Uh, give him your relationships. Give him your money and watch him multiply what you put in your hands. The Bible says they got filled up to the brim, had 12 basketfuls left over. My point is to First Baptist Indian Trail, hey, hey let's go through these tough times together. Let, let's take what we have and put it in the hands of the Lord and see what he does with it. Turn in your Bible with me for just a real quick moment to Acts chapter 2. Uh, Acts chapter 2, and I want you to see uh, verse 42. Acts chapter 2 and uh, verse 42. And they continued, here, here's the, the New Testament church. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that, watch this, and all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, thank God, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. We're going to break bread together here the last Sunday of January. I, I hope all of you will be here as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. We have a wonderful prayer ministry. Uh, the Bible says they continued steadfastly in prayer. And I believe with all of my heart, if God is going to accomplish what he wants to accomplish through us, we've got to spend more time in prayer. There are boxes all over uh, this building where you could drop in your prayer requests. Maybe you want to be one of the prayer warriors, then sign up and get involved in the prayer ministry. There are all kinds of opportunities that we could serve God uh, together here at First Baptist. Maybe you're here this morning and you're just simply hurting. Um, maybe you've never experienced the touch of God on your life. 
Maybe you don't know what it's like to have the burden of the guilt of sin and shame lifted off of you. Maybe you don't know what it's like just to walk with God uh, on a daily basis. Uh, maybe you don't know what it's like uh, to have the assurance that when you die that you are going to heaven. Maybe you are saved, but you're going through a lot of heartache right now. Understand something, Jesus is your source. Jesus is your supplier. And I just challenge you to seek after the Lord with all of your heart. And for those of you that have never engaged in generosity, determine right now, uh, I, I want the righteousness of God to go before me. I, I want him to be my rear guard. I want him to meet the needs that I have in my life as they come up. And so I'm going to seek to be that generous person. I, I, I'm going to put this to the test. I, I'm going to see if God really means business. And Maybe you just need to decide today that you're going to be generous, that you're going to be a giver. If you need Jesus into your heart and your life, he's here today. He will forgive you of your sin. He will save your soul. He will change your life. Would you stand with me and let's pray together. Father, I just pray for our internet audience. I pray for our in-house congregation. Lord, if there's one here this morning that does not know you, as Lord and Savior, Lord, would you just open their blinded eyes to see their need for you right now? And Lord, would you grant to them that gift of repentance and may they seek your face and beg your forgiveness for the sins of their life, receive you into their heart and into their life. I pray for those that may be looking for a church home to be able to worship you and, and Lord, to share uh, the talents and gifts, abilities, in the body of Christ, and, and they believe that it's here, I pray that you give them the courage to step out and be a part of this church and this fellowship today. I pray for those that are going through pain and suffering and heartache and got a lot of needs in their life. God, I pray that they'll find their way to this altar and just begin to do what you told them to do, which was to simply ask. I ask all of it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.